So the AP Calculus test is coming, and if you're preparing for that, then this video is for you because we'll go over all six questions from the 2023 AP Calculus AB for response questions. And I will have the link to the test in the description so you can try the questions first before you watch the video. And before we start, I just want to thank today's sponsor, Brilliant.Work, and let me tell you a little bit more about them. Brilliant is an online learning platform that helps you to excel in math and science. Their goal is to provide the most effective way for you to learn. I really like Brilliant not only because they got thousands of interactive lessons ranging from basic algebra to advanced math, but also each lesson is filled with hands-on problem solving that lets you test out the concepts along the way. As a math teacher for over 10 years, I always advise my students that you need to be constantly learning and practicing in order to reach your goal. Now you can try Brilliant for free for 30 days. Use the link in the description, Brilliant.org slash BlackPenRedPen, so that you can also get 20% off discount for the annual premium subscription. And I want to thank Brilliant for sponsoring this video, and I also want to thank you guys for checking them out. For the first one, we are first given a table, and it's about pumping gasoline into a tank. And our function f of t represents the rate of the flow of the gasoline. First, we are going to interpret the meaning of this integral. And because we are integrating a rate function, so just get the original back. So the integral from 60 to 135, it represents the total number. And the reason I say total is because you see that all these numbers are non-negative. And because we are pumping gas into the tank, we are only going to get more and more gas, right? So the total number of gallons of gasoline that's pumped into the tank. And because we are going from 60 to 135, so we'll just say from t equals 60 and then unit for t is seconds and then we'll just say to t equals 135 seconds all right now the second part is that we are going to be using a right remote sum so that's just the right end point rectangle approximation and we are given these three intervals So let me draw a picture for you guys. First, let's draw a number line, and then we start with 60, and then 90, and then 120, and lastly, we need a 135. So because we have a right endpoint rectangle approximation, what we want to do is, on this interval, we pick the right endpoint, which is the 90 here. So we look up to the table, when t is 90, f of t is 0 0.15. So you just go up 0 0.15, and you draw a rectangle. And now let's just go ahead and write that down. The integral going from 60 to 135. The first rectangle, the base is 30. Right from 60 to 90 is 30. And we're just going to multiply by f of 90 and let me just set this up first next we are going to add the next rectangle we go from 90 to 120 so that's another 30 and then we have to go to when t is equal to 120 and you see the value of the function is 0 0.1 so we go up like this and then we draw a rectangle so 30 times f of 120 and then lastly for the last rectangle, it's only from 120 to 135, so that's only 15. And then we multiply by f of 135. So that's like this right here. So when we compute this, this is going to be the rectangle approximation. So this right here should have been uh, approximation symbol. And now I'm saying this, it's equal to the following. We have 30 times f of 90 is just 0 0.15. And then we add 30 times f of 120, which is 0 
and then we add 15 times f of 135, which is 0.05. And now using your calculator, we will get 8.25. And remember, this right here is the total number of gallons of gas that's pumped into the tank, right, from 60 seconds to the 135 seconds. And just approximation. All right, so that's the first one. And now, part B, you know how this is for AP calculus, right? So we have only six questions, but each question has four parts. All right, now, right here, the question is asking us, must there exist the value C, so that C is in between of 60 and 120, and F prime of C is equal to zero? This sounds like what? A main value theorem question, right? Yes, it is. So first, let's observe the values at the endpoint. We know f of 60 is 0 0.1, and f of 120 is 0 0.1 as well. So the idea is, if we are looking at 60 to 120, they have the same y value. Hmm. How does the function behave, though? Well, firstly, we know that right here the function is continuous. Well, it's differentiable, which implies continuity, right? So, when you connect the dots, it has to be continuous. And no matter how you connect it, you see, you will have to at least one place that the derivative there is zero. You could have also been like this, right? So, that's the idea. And because the value of the functions is the same at the end point, you can also call the row zero. It's just a specific case for the mean value theorem. But anyway, though, here is what you have to be careful. In order for us to use the mean value theorem, we have to mention that since f is differentiable, which implies f is continuous on the interval that we want, which is 60 to 120, and then let's just go ahead and do the computation for them. So we find the slope of these two points, right, between these two points. So f of 120 minus f of 60 over 120 minus 60. So that's 0 0.1 minus 0 0.1 over 60, and that's equal to 0. And remember, this is where we say we have f prime of c, and c is in between of 60 and 120. Right, that's the conclusion of the mean value theorem. So now, let's just go ahead and finish writing this down. Here we say by the mean value theorem. Again, you can also call the row theorem. We must have a C on the interval and for this interval here, it's in between, so you do not include the endpoints. So I will just emphasize that on um, the interval. Let me actually write it down like this. Let me let me write it down like this. A C so that C is in between of 60 and 120. I'll just write it down like how they did it as well. It will be super clear that way. Earlier I was trying to write 60 to 120, but of course this kind of interval notation always looks like a point, right? So, mm, not the best. This right here is better. C is on this interval, and we also know that f prime of c has to be equal to zero there, and then we are done. So that's number one, part b. Now, number one, part c. Here, earlier it was just a table of values. But right now, it's giving us that we have a function that can model this table of values. So g of t, this right here is still the rate of the flow. And then right here, we are going to use this model, and we are going to find the average rate of flow of the gasoline. So we are trying to find the average of this function. Therefore, we just have to remember the average value formula which is just the integral, and because we are going from 0 to 150, and then let's just, perhaps I will write down the function. 
and then we have the t over 120 square and then don't forget the dt we integrate it and we will have to divide it by the length of this interval we go from 0 to 150 so we do 1 over 150 minus 0 and then right here you just have to use a calculator i believe you don't necessarily have to show the integration because this is on the calculator part so if you just enter this expression onto your calculator you will get approximately 0 0.096 so that's the answer but what's the unit though this right here is the average rate of flow right and the unit for this is gallons per second done now last part of question number one we are still going to be using the g function from part c and this time we are going to find the value of g prime of 140 and then interpret the meaning so let me just write down the function again we know g of t it was given to be t over 500 times cosine of t over 120 squared like this and then to get g prime of 140 i strongly believe that you can just enter um, this function and then use the tit4 or a graphing calculator and find the derivative i strongly believe you can just do that correct me if i'm wrong though um yeah because on the what's that called on the grading guide it doesn't mention that you have to find the derivative by using the product rule and all that stuff so i am just going to keep like that keep it like this all right fine 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 i'm going to differentiate it for you guys well no i don't know all right i'm just going to tell you guys to use your calculator because earlier for this one i just use a calculator for this integral right although you can do yourself for that so why not just use the, why not just use the calculator for this so anyway though if you know for sure that we have to do the product rule and then the chain rule then leave a comment down below i will make another video showing you guys how to do the derivative by hand but this right here if you use the calculator you get approximately negative 0 0.00 5. now let's think about it remember g of t is the rate of flow of the gasoline right and now this right here is what this is how fast the rate of flow is going to change right and because we have a negative derivative that means the rate of the rate of the flow is going to be decreasing so let's see i'm just going to write it down like this the rate i'm just going to be using the same wording from the um, what's that called study not study guide grading guide the rate at which gasoline is flowing into the tank is here we are going to mention that it's decreasing because we have a negative derivative decreasing at a rate of 0 0.005 and notice earlier because we mentioned the word decreasing so we don't have to use the negative right here so this right here is the wording from the uh, official solution and uh, here we have to talk about the unit 0 0.005 gallon and now because earlier for g the unit for that is gallon per second and then when we differentiate this again we divide it by time again right so it's gallon per second square 
or per second per second, depending on how you want to say it. So that's it. Yeah, and then perhaps you can also mention at time equals 140. So perhaps I will say gallon per second per second. So that's per second square at t equals oops it's not one it's not sorry it's not 14 it's 140. I was like too busy mentioning about the calculator at t equals 140 second. Okay for number two we are given the velocity function and Stephen is swimming and the first part is that we have to find t in the interval from 0 to 90 so that Stephen changes direction. Changes direction means that the velocity changes sign. So what we need first is we have to look for v of t equals 0 first. So that implies 2.38 e to the negative 0 0.02 t times sine of pi over 56 t, it has to be equal to 0. And now because this is a product of two functions, that means we have to set 2.38 e to the negative 0 0.02 t equals 0. And then we also set this right here equals 0. But for the first part right here, e to the whatever, this is not going to be equal to 0. And don't say negative infinity. So this right here is actually impossible. We don't have a solution for that. But for this right here, hmm, sign of what will give us 0 though? Well, I'll just put this down right here for you guys. We know that sign of 0 is equal to 0, but we are not going to include 0, so we don't look at that. Next, we also know sign of pi, that will also be equal to 0. Sign of 2 pi will also be 0, so on, so on, so on. So what we need to do first is we are going to set inside pi over 56 t. We have to make it equal to pi. All right, let's solve for t right here first. We are going to multiply by the reciprocal. So we have 56 over pi on both sides like this. So that this, this cancel, this and that cancel. So t equals pi and pi cancel, so we have 56. And now imagine if we set this equal to 2 pi, well, we will have to do 2 times 56, and that's going to be over 90. So we are not going to include this. So we're not looking at this, we're not looking at that. So t is equal to 56, and uh, let me erase this right here. And t is equal to 56 seconds. And why is this though? I will just mention that um, I'll just use the official wording again. So I'll say Stephen changes direction at t equals 56 second because his velocity technically you should also sign you should also show a sign chart but I think from the official solution you can just mention it all you have to do is just say that his uh, velocity changes signs at t equals 56 second. All right. And again, if you want to just do a little sign chart is here, you draw a little number line. And then right here, you mark 56 second. And then here we have the velocity and you pick a number less than 56, right? You can test a lot, say, uh, 50. And then you plug into here. And I'll just tell you and that was a positive value. And if you pick a number bigger than 56, let's say 60, if you plug into here, right, for the velocity function, you end up with a 
negative result. So the velocity does change sign at t equals 56 second. All right? Now, part B, find the acceleration at t equals 60. So for this right here, acceleration is just a derivative of the velocity. So I really doubt that if we have to find the derivative by hand because from the solution, they just they just show us the answer. So I don't know. Okay, earlier I didn't do a derivative for you guys. For this one, I will do the derivative for you guys, okay? So just for fun. But if you can just use the calculator, go ahead, do it. So if you have, or if you know, like if you are familiar, like if you are familiar with the like AP test, yeah, because AP test is was so long ago for me. I don't know how the rule is anymore. Okay, let's just do the derivative, right? A of t. It's just the derivative of the velocity. Here, we are going to use the product rule and then the chain rule and the crazy stuff. Now, I'm going to keep the first function right here. This is my first function. So 2.38 e to the negative 0.02t. And I'm going to multiply by the derivative of the second. The derivative of sine is cosine. And then we have pi over 56t times the derivative of the inside which is just this number, because it's just a number times t to the first power, right? So we multiply by pi over 56. Then we add the second function times the derivative of the first. This is a constant multiple, so I'm just going to keep that. And then e to the something is just always e to the that. And then we multiply by the derivative of the inner function for that, which is because of the chain rule, so negative 0 0.02. All right, so now everybody should be happy now. <laughs> and then just plug in 6t. So a of 6t, I'm not going to do, you know, show you guys the plugin, just enter this on your calculator and then do it carefully, or just go to second calc and then, you know, dy dx, that kind of thing. But you will get approximately negative 0 0.036 and we don't have to explain or we just have to explain stuff this acceleration has the unit meter per second per second so per second square right because it's like velocity is the rate right which has like meter per second and then if you take the derivative you divide it by the time again so per second again now, second part, is Stephen speeding up or slowing down? Remember, for this kind of questions, we have to check both the acceleration and also the velocity. We have the acceleration already. So if we look at v of 6t, we will plug in 6t into the velocity equation. And if you work that out, you get approximately negative 0.1. 595 so it's about one point it's supposed to negative to 1.6 right which is less than zero all right here is the conclusion is Stephen speeding up or slowing down i will just write this down again Stephen is speeding up right because both the uh, just say both his uh, both of both of his velocity and acceleration have the same sign. We can also mention that because they are both negative, so same thing. And then we're done for that. That's the second part. Now, part C, find the distance between 
Stephen's position at 20 and 80. And this is just the change in distance, right? The change in distance. So all you have to do for this right here is just integrate going from 20 to 80 of our velocity function. Because this right here is just a change in distance. So I'll just write that down right here for you guys real quick. This is just a change in, well, changing position, technically changing position. Why? Because you remember when you integrate phi of t, you get back the position function, right? And let's say if you go from a to b, then you will have to plug in a to b. So you are just looking at the final position minus the initial position. So that's the changing distance that you have. All right, now you can just go ahead and use your calculator for this, right? Here is our velocity function. Enter down the calculator and integrate that. This right here is approximately 23.384. And because this is a distance, so the unit for that is just meters. And just have to set up your calculation. You do not have to integrate this by hand. Okay, now part D is a little bit different. It's a total distance. So this right here is just a little difference. All you have to do is you have to find the integral. And here we are talking about from 0 to 90. So integrate it from 0 to 90. And remember earlier, when we integrate v of t, this is just a change in position. So remember, it can be like this. If he is like going up like going to a right like this, and then come back like this, then the changing position is only this much, right? But the total distance is actually this plus that. So the difference between Part C and Part D is that when we integrate the velocity, if we are trying to find the total distance, we will have to attach the absolute value. All right? And that's pretty much it. Use a calculator again, you get 62.164. And the unit for that is meters. Done. All right. Now, no more calculators. Number three. This is a differential equation, and uh, we have this right here, right? And we also have a point. It's a slow field question. I love this so much. So let's go ahead and get started. All we have to do is sketch a solution curve, and the point is 0, 0,5, which is right here. So now let's just follow along. So trace it, right? Just follow along with like the little tangent segments like this. And make sure you don't touch the horizontal acetone. And that's it. That will do it. <laughs> Very nice, huh? Okay. Now, part two. We are going to use the tangent line approximation to get M2. And the tangent line is at t is equal to 0. Okay. Right. So, Firstly, we will have to get the slope. And then also, let me remind you guys the tangent line uh, formula for that. So for tangent line, if we have, oh, I'll just write this down. Line tangent to, let's say, a value A, and then, mm, let's say, F of A, like this, right? All you have to do is Y equals F of A plus the derivative there, and then you do x minus a, just like this. So let's go ahead and get the derivative, because in this case, our point is, when t is equal to 0, with the po our point is 0, 0,5 already. So this is a, and this is f of a. And now for the derivative, here we have dm dt, so let me just write down dm dt is 1 over 4, and then we have 4t minus m. And then m is the function that we are talking about here. So in this case, m is just going to be 5. 
So this right here is just going to be 5 because this is the m value and this is the t value. So the slope at m is equal to 5 is equal to 1 over 4 times 40 minus 5. And we will get 35 over 4. Now, just drawing into the tangent line formula, we will have y equals 5 for f of a, and then plus the slope, which is this, 35 over 4, and then multiply by x minus a, which is 0. So in another word, the tangent line is just nicely equal to, let's write this down first. We have 3 over 5, 35 over 4, sorry, x plus 5. So that's the tangent line. Now, we will also have to get m2. So I will just say m2. This right here is approximately, just go ahead and plug in. Well, actually, I'm not using x, I'm using t. So I should change this to, well, uh, that's in general, so let's use t right here. Yeah, let's, let's change that to T. So M2 is when T is equal to 2 and then plug into here. So we get this approximately to be 35 over 4 times 2 and then plus 5, which this right here gives you 22.5. So final answer M2 is a approximately 22.5 degree Celsius. Okay. Now, next one, we are going to write an expression for the second derivative, which is d2m dt2. So let's go and do that. And then we are going to determine if the approximation that we got earlier is an underestimation or an overestimation. The second derivative is the derivative of the first derivative. So we are going to differentiate dm dt, which is given to be this. So we have 1 over 4 times 40 minus m. And now remember, m is a function of time. So I think that's going to do this right here is going to be a little bit easier. I'm going to distribute the 1 over 4. So d dt, and then we will get 10 minus 1 over 4 m. All right, the derivative of 10 is just 0, and then minus 1 over 4. And now we are taking the derivative of m with respect to t. So this right here actually gives us dm dt. But what's dm dt again? Well, we just have to write this down again, which is given right here, right? dm dt. So let's go ahead, just write that down again. So this is negative 1 over 4 times 1 over 4, and then 40 minus m. So simplify that a little bit. We get negative 1 over 16, and then 40 minus m. So that is the expression for the d2m d t2. Okay, now, how do we know if this approximation is an overestimation or underestimation? Well, remember, this is the tangent line approximation, right? And in fact, you can also look at this, but let's not look at this. So the idea is that imagine if we have a function that's concave up, then when we draw a tangent line, all the tangent lines is going to be below the curve. So this right here will be underestimation. And then if we draw a curve that's concave down, then all the tangent lines will be above the curve. So this will be an overestimation. 
So therefore, we just have to check the sign for the second derivative. And we have this right here though, but we will go back to the question. Right here it says that it can be shown that m of t is less than 40 for all t. So we can just use that. So here we go. I'm just going to say, since we know m of t is less than 40 for all t, so d2m dt2, which is negative 1 over 16, 40 minus m, well, because m is less than 40, so that means this is going to be less than 40, so that means 40 minus a smaller number than 40, this will be positive. But we have a negative times a positive, so all in all, this right here will be less than 0. Therefore, we have a concave down situation. So, I will just tell you, I will just write this down. M is concave down. Therefore, so, the tangent line approximation is over is an overestimate. It's an overestimate. Okay, All right. Again, here we are talking about. You can actually draw the graph, right? Because we actually know how the curve goes already from part A. So it's over, right? Because this is above that. So that's the idea. Now solve a differential equation. Okay, solve this differential equation. So here we go. So we have dm dt equals 1 over 4, 40 minus m. Let's multiply dt on both sides. So we get dm equals 1 over 4, and then 40 minus m dt. And then let's divide this on both sides. So we get 1 over 40 minus m dm equals 1 over 4 dt. Okay, integrate both sides. So on the left hand side, we get ln absolute value and then we have 40 minus m. But be careful though, here we have a negative m. So we have to multiply by 1 over negative 1, right? So here is just a formula. Let me remind you guys somewhere right here. So remember, when we integrate 1 over ax plus b dx, this right here, we get ln absolute value of ax plus b. And of course, don't forget the plus c, right? But because the derivative of the bottom is a, so we have to divide it by that. So we have 1 over a. And this works when we have a linear factor on the bottom, which is the same as this case. So that's why we have the negative right here. And now on the right hand side, and right here we don't have to put on plus c, just put down the plus c on the right hand side. So we have 1 over 4. Integrating 1 over 4 in the t world, so it's 1 over 4 t. And then I'll just say plus c. So you have two ways to go about this. One is that you can solve for C right here, right now by using the initial condition, or you can solve for M first and then solve for C later. I'm going to do the later one. Right? So I will call this C1 because the C is going to change. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply everybody by negative one. So I will get ln absolute value 40 minus m, and that's equal to, we will have a negative here, 1 over 4 t, and then technically we have minus c1, right? But minus c1 is just a constant, so I'm going to relabel that as another constant, so c2. And then after that, I'm just going to do exponentiation both sides, so e to the power and e to the power, so that this and that cancel. And then on the left hand side, we have the absolute value 40 minus m. And the right hand side is e 
to this power. So e to the negative 1 over 4t plus c2. But now, since we said that m is less than 4t for ot, right? Then we can actually just get rid of the absolute value. So our negative, so absolute value of 40 minus m is just 40 minus m. We don't have to worry about the absolute value. So the left hand side is just 40 minus m. And for the right hand side, I will write it as e to the negative 1 over 4t times e to the c2 by the rule of exponents. Yeah. And now, C2 is a constant, E is a constant, E2 another constant is just another constant. So I'm going to relabel that as C3. So 40 minus M equals, let me put that down first. So C3, right, this right here is C3. And then we have E to the negative 1 over 4T. Now I'm just going to bring the 40 to the other side. and then divide it by negative 1 so that I get the m by itself and then we get 40 and then c3 is a constant all for negative 1 is also a constant so together I'm just going to say that's plus c4 and then e to the negative 1 over 4t and the reason I like to do this is because Sometimes they might ask you for like the general solution, and this right here is the general solution. And uh, once you have this, you can write this down as the function notation if you would like. So that means m of t equals 40 plus, because we are done, so we can just say c4 is the c, and then e to the negative 1 over 4t. But we're not done yet, though, because the question is asking us what's the initial condition n of 0 is equal to 5. So we know m of 0 is equal to 5. That means we're plugging 0 into the t here, and we get 5. So 40 plus c e to the negative 1 over 4, and the t is equal to 0. So work this out. We get 5 equals 40 plus e to the 0 is just 1, so we just have c. And then minus 40 on both sides, c is equal to negative 35. Now put it back, we have our nice function, n of t equals 40, and the constant is minus 35, and then we have e to the negative 1 over 4, t. Done! Alright, so let me show you guys everything right here. I do admit that if you just isolate, if you just look for C right here, it will be easier. Uh, you guys can look at the uh, official solution if you want to go about that approach. Now, number four. All right, we're given the graph of the derivative. So this is f prime. All right, such a classic question. Does the original, right? It's almost always given the graph of the derivative, and then you answer about the original. Does f have a relative min, max, or neither at 6? Well, let's observe at 6. Okay, remember, anything above the x-axis is positive, anything below is negative. So as you can see, at 6, the curve crosses the x-axis, which is, you know, meaning that's equal to zero, but the curve is above and likewise above. So the derivative does not change sine 6, so the answer for this right here is going to be a uh, neither. And I just recently found out I'm going to do this and it's going to make it so much easier to understand. Whenever you have this kind of question, just do this, right? Go ahead, find out where the curve crosses the zero. So we have negative 1, 2, and 6. These are the critical values. I'm going to draw the sign chart right here. And this is for the first derivative. 
we have negative 1, 2, and 6. Now, when x is less than negative 1, the curve is above the x-axis, so it's positive. So I'm going to put down positive. And then in between of negative 1 and 2, we have below the x-axis, so negative. And then from 2 to 6, from 2 to 6, it's above, so it's positive. And then from 6 and, up, and afterward, it's also positive. So remember, this sign chart is for the first derivative. So at 6, when you see this right here, it's easier to understand. Right? So if you take some time to change from the graph to the sign chart, uh, I think it will be easier for a lot of students. So I would just say f has neither a relative min or max at x equals 6 because f prime does not change sign. Add x equal to 6. All right. All right. So that's part A. Now for part 2, on what open interval is the function, this is the original function, concave down. Okay. Again, we are talking about given the uh, derivative graph and then answer about the original. So f is concave down implies we want f double prime to be less than zero. And if we have f double prime less than zero, that means f prime has to decrease. All right, so that's the implication, and that's the implication. Go like this. Okay, so keep that in mind, and let's just see where is the function concave down. Well, let's see where f prime is decreasing. So we see that from negative two to zero, and then from four to negative six. Right. So that will be the answer, and then. It's asking for open intervals. So I will just write it down like this. F is concave down. On the interval, intervals. Mm, let me just write it like this. F let's use interval notation from negative 2 to 0 and also from 4 to 6. And this right here are intervals, so that's why I'm like emphasizing their intervals because otherwise you know, negative 2 comma 0 looks like a point, but it's not. So it's concave down on these two intervals because f prime, let me just use this right here, f prime is decreasing on these intervals, right? So that should do it. Now, number four. Wow, there's a limit question. Okay, and then here we are also have we also have this information f of two is equal to zero. So firstly though, let's see this. Hmm. Do we know f is continuous? Well we know f prime. F prime always exists, so that means f is differentiable. So I'll just say since f is differentiable, so f is continuous, which implies 
we must have the limit as x approaching 2 of f of x equals 2. And the reason I want to mention this is because I'm going to legitimately plug in 2 into this function here. So I'm just going to show it the limit as x approaching 2 of 6 times f of x minus 3x over x squared minus 5x plus 6. This right here gives us 6 times f of 2 and then min then let me actually just work this out like this because they are not equal. I shall mm, I shall I shall I shall Let, let's let's do this. Hmm. Yeah, let, let me just do it like this. 6 f of 2 minus 3 times 2 over 2 squared minus 5 times 2 plus 6. Because it's not going to be equal because data we get 0 over 0. <laughs> so this is just a check. You plug in 2 into all the x's and see what happens. And then right here, we know f of 2 is equal to 1. So this right here tells us we have 6 times 1. And then just do the rest, right? So minus 6 over, in fact, the bottom is equal to 0. You see it, and then this is equal to 0 over 0. And this right here tells us that we have an indeterminate form, meaning we have to do more work in order to figure out the this answer. Now, this answer for this, actually. All right, thankfully, we have 0 over 0. So we can do Laputal's rule. So 0 over 0, let's apply Laputal's rule. So that means this right here, we check the limit as x approaching 2. 6 times f of x, the derivative of that is just 6 times f prime of x. And then the derivative of minus 3x is minus 3. And again, we're just taking the derivative of the top. And then take the derivative of the bottom. And for the bottom, we get 2x minus 5. Now I'm going to be plugging 2 again, and this time it will work. 6 times f prime of 2 minus 3. Let me actually just do what I like to do, like this, plugging the numbers in red. Okay, what's f prime of 2 though? Hmm, we have a graph right here, right? So when x is 2, okay, it's on the x-axis. So f, of, f prime of 2 is actually equal to 0. So right here, this is going to be 6 times 0 to 0. And then minus 3 over 4 minus 5, which is negative 1. So on all, the answer for this right here, it's equal to 3. So that will be the final answer for that. Right? Okay, number four. We are going to find the absolute minimum. Hmm. We are going to find the absolute minimum value of f on the closed interval from negative 2 to 8. So let me actually go back to here and then copy and paste of what we did from this right here. Right? Because it's going to be helpful. All right. If we just focus on the sign chart, seriously, this right here is going to be so much less intimidating. And from here, remember, negative 1, 2, and 6, they are the critical values because that's where the derivatives is equal to 0. And then you see, derivative goes from positive to negative. So that means we have a local, but here we say relative maximum at negative 1, right? And then when the derivative goes from negative to positive, we have a relative minimum at x equal to 2. And at 6, this right here is neither. All right, with that in mind, and maybe you want to write it down like for your work right here as well. Well, here we are going to find the absolute minimum. So what do we do? Of course, all we have to do is 
I will first mention that since f prime changes from negative to positive at x equals 2. So let me just say so f has a relative minimum at x equals 2. And then we don't have to bother with the other critical values. So this is the value that we have to check. Now we just have to check when x is equal to 2. And then we also have to check when x is at the endpoints, which is negative 2 and also x equals 8. Which value is the smallest will give us the absolute minimum of the value. So let's do f of negative 2 first. No, actually, no, let's do f of 2 first. So f of 2, this right here, hmm, let's see. Ah, f of 2 is equal to 1. <laughs> um, by given. <laughs> f of 2 is equal to, is equal to 1, it's, it's given. Now, how do we do f of negative 2, though? Sorry about that. How do we do f of negative 2? Hmm, we must be using like this kind of um, graph, right? Now, let me remind you guys the following. Um, if we integrate from negative 2 to 2 of our derivative, we first find antiderivative for f prime. The antiderivative of f prime is just the function itself, right? f. Integral and derivative cancel. And then if we integrate from negative 2 to 2, we plug in 2 first. And then minus, we plug in negative 2. So as you can see, if we want to find f of negative 2, all we have to do is bring this to the other side, and then bring the integral to the other side. So it's f of 2 minus the integral from negative 2 to 2, f of x. Yeah. I put this to the other side, and I put this to the other side. All right. So let me just write this down legitimately for you guys. f of 2 equals, so f of negative 2 equals, going from f of 2. And the reason I put down f of 2 is because we have a specific value, right? Because it's given. So we can use that. So we have that. And then from there, we are going to subtract the integral going from negative 2 to 2, f of f prime of x. Technically, this is f prime, sorry, f prime. Okay, so I'm going to just erase this. Now, I am going to write it down here. f of 2 is 1 minus what is this? we will have to find the area. So the integral going from negative 2 to 2 f prime of x. So let's come back here. We are looking at the area under the curve right from here to here. But remember, the value of uh, integral could be negative. So if the region is above, we take that as positive. If the region is below the x-axis, we take that as negative. So for this area, it's 1 times 2 and it's a triangle. So the area is 1 half times base times 2. So that's equal to 1. All right? And then for this area, 1, 2, 3. So this is 3. And then the height right here is 2. So for this right here, right? the area, okay, it's a triangle. It's still 1 half times base times 2. So this is equal to 3. Okay, but if you're talking about the integral going from negative 1 to 2 of f prime of x, this right here, you'll take it as negative because it's below the x-axis. And then for this one right here, the integral going from negative 2 
to negative 1, this is still positive because it's above the x-axis. So altogether, to figure out this, we just have to combine the 1 and the negative 3, which is negative 2. So 1 minus negative 2, we get 3. OK, and then let's do f of 8. So f of 8, it's pretty much the same thing. We start with f of 2 because that's the only value that we have. So we have to subtract. Hmm. This time, let's do it carefully. Uh, remember, we want to do from 2 to 8, right? So this will be f of 8 minus f of 2, right? So to get f of 8, we will do this and then put the other side. So it's actually f of 2 plus the integral going from 2 to 8 and then f prime of x. The official solution make this question seems like so simple, but it's a lot of small details. So hopefully this right here is clear. Yeah. All right. So the integral from 2 to 8. So now here we go again. So here, see, I really have no idea. Like the solution make is so simple. But the good thing is this is all above the x axis. So you know. That's not going to give us a minimum, but I will still compute it for you guys. All right, this is two and this is two. So the area is one half two times two, which is just a two, which is the same as the integral. Now, this right here and this, yeah, it's the area under the curve. But this right here, I will just tell you, we will do the area of the rectangle, which is 1, 2, 3, 4. The base is 4 times the height is 2. Right, 4 times 2, which is 8. And then I'm going to subtract this circle here, or semicircle. The radius here is 2, and the area here that's missing is 1 half, because it's just a semicircle, times pi. And the r is 2. So that is going to be 1 half 4 pi, which is just 2 pi. So we have to minus 2 pi. So it's 8 minus 2 pi. Right? And then together, I'll come back here. f of 1. So f of 2 is 1. And we add this it's equal to we have 2 from here and then 8 minus 2 pi from here. So I'll just write down plus 2 plus 8 minus 2 pi. So all in all, we get 11 yeah, minus 2 pi. All right, so this is how they got all these numbers. And it's like they really make it a little bit like seem a little bit too easy. But anyway, though. Which one is the smallest? Of course, this right here is the smallest. So I'll just say absolute minimum is um, f of 2 is equal to 1. Yeah. And if you want to be precise, you should say the minimum, the absolute minimum value of f is 1. You give the y value for the minimum value. And that happens at x equal to 2. So just like that. OK. I think this should be clear. So yeah. All right. That took a while. Now, number 5. All right, table question. Who doesn't love a table question? So we are given a bunch of derivatives and all that. And then f and g are twice differentiable h is defined to be f of g of x and then we are going to find h prime of 7 all right this is just a chain rule question so here we go h of x equals we first differentiate the outside and we keep the inside and then we use the chain rule 
right? So multiply by g prime of x. And then we're just plugging 7 into x. So we have prime of g of 7 and then times g prime of 7. And now let's do this inside out. h of 7, we will have to figure out g of 7 first. g of 7, when x is 7, and then we are looking at the regular g function, which is 0, right? So again, x is 7, g of x is equal to 0. So inside here is 0, and then we get f prime of 0, then times g prime of 7. What's g prime of 7? Let's also do that. When x is 7, g prime is 8. So we multiply by 8. Right? So this right here is 8. Now, f prime of 0, when x is 0, f prime is 3 over 2. So that will be this right here is 3 over 2, and then we multiply it by 8. So that will be 12. Let me just double check. Mm, yeah, that's all we need to do. All right, part B. Let k be a differential of function so that we get the derivative k is equal to this. Is the graph of k concave up or concave down at x equals 4. So this right here, what we need is the second derivative of k. So we are going to just look at that k is pressure and then take the derivative twice. All right, this time right here, we really have to take out the derivative. There's no way around. Calculator is not going to help, right? So let me just write down the k prime expression right here. Okay, k double prime. This is my first function. I will keep that. And then we multiply by the derivative of the second, which is just g prime of x. And then we add the second function. And then we multiply by the derivative of the first. And to find the derivative, we first bring the power to the front and then minus 1. So we have 2 times f of x to the first power, and then we multiply by the derivative inside. So here we need f prime of x. Now we need to get when x is equal to 4, so k double prime of 4. This right here is equal to f of 4, and then square times g prime of 4. And then plus, let me put a 2 all the way in the front right here. And then we have the g of 4. And then f of 4. And then lastly, times f prime of 4. All right. Now, let's see. When x is 4, I'm just going to use a highlight. Term. I think it might be, well, actually, they still use the blue pen. I know I'm not black pen, red pen today. I think blue pen stands out better for this one. So anyway, f of 4, when x is 4, f of x is 4. So this right here is just 4. Right, this right here is just 4. And then we still have to square that, though. Then we multiply by g prime of 4. 4 and then g prime is 2. So that is equal to 2. Multiply by 2. And then we add 2 times g of 4. 4 and then we're looking at the original g, which is negative 3. So that will be right here. Then f of 4. Again, 4 and then f is 4. So multiply by 4. And then f prime of 4, 4 and then f prime. This right here gives us 3.
All right, and then let me just double check and triple check. Okay, and then just use the calculator. Well, no, sorry, you have to. You cannot use the calculator. So just do it by hand. And I will tell you the answer. Yeah, just do it by hand. It's arithmetic. So negative 40, and then we are done. Okay. Yeah, just worked out. And that's it. Okay. And now, the next one, let m be the function defined by this thing here, and we are going to find n of 2. All right, so here we go. m of 2. We're just going to be plugging 2 into all the x that we see. So we have 5 times 2 to the third power. And then plus integral going from 0. And then here we have x, right? x right now is 2. And then here we have f prime of t dt. All right, the first part is easy because this is just a number. But this right here, what does this mean though? Well, it's just that what we did earlier with this question right here, right? With this question right here, I erased it. But I will remind you, when we integrate a derivative, they just pretty much cancel. So this part and this part and this part right here is just that we have f of t. Yeah, after you integrate f prime, you have f of t. And then you plug in 0 to 2. And you get f of 2 minus f of 0, just like that. So this right here, let's work it out. 2 to the third power is 8 times 5 is 40. And then we will have to add f of 2 minus f of 0. So that's 40, f of 2 when x is 2, f is 7. So this gives us 7. And then minus f of 0, when x is 0, the function f is 10. So minus 10. So 47 minus 10, that should be 32. No, just kidding, 37. <laughs> All right, next one. Is the function m in part c increasing, decreasing one either at x equal to oh yeah, I think that's this is a nice one. So we have oh okay, now it's the derivative. Okay. So let me write that down again. M of x equals we have this function, right? So 5x third power plus the integral going from 0 to x f prime of t dt. Okay, is the function m increasing, decreasing? We will need m prime. So the derivative of this is just 15x to the second power. Now, what's the derivative of this? All we need is just the fundamental theorem of calculus part one. We just need to put the x right here. That's all. So in fact, we will just get plus f prime of x. So let me just write this down carefully. d dx of the integral function. Again, all we need to do is put the x in here. And usually you still have to check the chain rule. The derivative x is just 1, so it doesn't matter. So this right here will just give us, this right here stays the same. Like this. All right, now, m prime of 2, what do we get? We get 15 times 2 squared plus f prime of 2. OK, 2 squared is 4 times 15 is 60 plus m prime, so f prime of 2. Here is 2, f prime is negative 8. So we have negative 8 for this. So 60 plus negative 8, we get, now oh, this is tough, 52. All right? So m prime is actually positive. 
So I'll just say I'll just say m is increasing. B uh, so m m is increasing at x equals two because m prime of two, which is fifty two, is greater than zero. So this right here will be the final result. All right, last question. But you know, we have four more parts, right? So we are given this equation, and then we are going to find dy dx. It's just implicit differentiation. So let me just write this down again. And then we will do d dx. All right, this right here, we need the product rule for the left-hand side. This is my first function. I will keep that and multiply by the derivative of the second. The derivative of y with respect to x is dy dx. Then we add the second function, which is y, times the derivative of the first, which is just a 6. And that's equal to the derivative of 2 is 0. And the derivative of y to the third power, we first bring the 3 to the front and then minus 1 to the exponent. We get 3y squared. But we have to multiply by the derivative of y with respect to x which is dy dx. Now we just have to isolate dy dx. I'm going to put this to the other side. So on the left hand side, we have 6y, and then we have 3y squared dy dx minus 6x dy dx. From here, we can factor out the dy dx. And usually I like to put that at the end right here. And then just divide this on both sides. So dy dx equals 6x over 3y squared minus 6x. And here we can factor our 3 on the bottom. And then we get y squared minus 2x. And then reduce out 3 goes into 3 one time, 3 goes into 6 two times. So dy dx equals 2x over just this, which is y squared minus 2x. Okay, done for that. All right, for number two, we are going to see if we can find a horizontal tangent line to the curve. So earlier we know that our derivative is this, right? 2y over y squared minus 2x. All right, if we want the horizontal tangent line, then you are going to have the slope is equal to zero. So that means we must have 2y equals zero. So that means y is equal to zero. But this is not it. We also need to find the corresponding x value, right? So we are going to plug that into the original equation. And then let's see. The left hand side, 6 times x times 0 is just equal to 0. And the uh, right hand side, we have 2 plus 0, which is 2. But of course, this right here is impossible. All right. Therefore, this right here, in fact, we cannot find a horizontal tangent line. Now I'll just say there is no horizontal tangent line to the curve. OK, now for part C, let's try to find a horizon. All right, now for OK, now for part C, let's try to find a vertical tangent line. So from our derivative, 2y over y squared minus 2x, this time we want the derivative, we want the derivative to be undefined. So we are trying to get y squared minus 2x equal to zero. And just be careful with it. Let's see, I'm gonna solve for x. So I will put this to the other side. We get y squared equals 2x, and I'll divide the two on both sides. So I get x equals y squared over 2. Now 6x 
The x is I'm going to just write it as y squared over 2. And then we have y that's equal to 2 plus y to the third power. Let's see if we can find out what y is from here. So reduce this, we get 3, and then y squared times y, we have y to the third power. That's 2 plus y to the third power. And then we can minus y to the third power on both sides. So that will give us 3 minus 1 is 2y to the third power equals 2. Divide both sides by 2, we get y to the third power is equal to 1. And then we can just take the cube root on both sides. So that means y is equal to 1. So now we have y is equal to 1 and then just plug into the original. Or you can also plug in here, but I would like to just plug into the original. So we have 6x times y is 1. And then that's equal to 2 plus y to the third power. So it's 1 to the third power. So it's 6x equals 2 plus 1, which is 3. That means x is equal to 1 half. All right, so here we actually can find a vertical tangent line. So I'll just write down vertical tangent line. And let's say we have 1 half comma 1. So that's it. OK, last one. OK, we have a particle that's moving along the curve. And then when it reached this point, we know that the dx dt, so this is the changing position with respect to time right in the x direction. And then we are trying to find out what dy dt is. So yes. This is the related equation. So from 6xy equals 2 plus y to the third power, we will have to differentiate this equation with respect to time. And we have to remember that both x and y are changing with respect to time. So here, this is still a product of two functions. I'm going to keep the first function, and then we multiply by the derivative of the second, which is dy dt because we're taking the derivative with respect to t. Then we add the second function, which is y. Now be careful with the following. Take the derivative of 6x with respect to time. We get 6 and then dx dt, because x changes with respect to time. And then the derivative of 2 is 0. Now the derivative of y to the third power is 3y squared and we multiply by the derivative of y with respect to time, so it's dy dt. And then from the given information, we know the x value and the y value, and we also know the dx dt. So we can just plug in. So 6 and the x is 1 half, and then multiply by dy dt, which we don't know, and then plus y we know is negative 2, and then we multiply by 6, and then we also know dx dt, which is 2 over 3. And then that's equal to 3 times y, which is negative 2. And then square that, and then we are trying to get dy dt. All right, so let's clean up the little numbers. 6 times 1 half, that's just 3. And then dy dt. And then Negative 2 times 6 is negative 12. Negative 12 times 2 thirds reduce that will get negative 4 times 2 is minus 8. Then we have negative 2 squared, which is 4, times 3, which is 12, and then dy dt. Okay, let's go ahead and just minus 3 dy dt on both sides. So they cancel. So we get negative 8 equals 12 minus 3 is 9. And then we have dy dt. And then, ladies and gentlemen, just divide both sides by 9. So we get dy dt equals negative 9. Sorry, negative 8 over 9. And this is the rate. We should also include the unit. I don't know the measure in the distance, so just a unit, and then per 
second, I believe. Yeah, because he says unit per second. So cool. Unit per second. And that is it. Okay, so of course you know it. Best of luck to you on your AP Calculus test. And let me know how it goes. That's it.